2020 meeting of the Planning Commission will now come to order. So just a reminder that due to the COVID-19 concerns and the Boulder County offices being closed to May 31st, we're holding the meetings virtually um, and additional information on how to participate virtually can be found on the Planning Commission website web page, um, which is boco.org slash pc. Um, and there will be opportunity to provide public comment at the different dockets and I'll give instructions as those come up. So to get us started, I just want to take a quick roll call. So Ann Goldfarb. Present. Dan Hilton. Present. Mark Bloomfield. Present. Melanie Nesky. Present. Sam Libby. Present. And Sam Fitch. Present. And then we know that Gavin and Todd are not able to join us today. And this is Commissioner Alicia Gargano um, speaking. <laughs> So I didn't announce myself at the beginning. Um, so just a reminder uh, on that note to identify yourself before speaking and to speak slowly and clearly. We are gonna do roll call votes for all of our votes today. Um, we're gonna remember to turn on our video uh, whenever possible so that everyone can see us and stay on mute until we're ready to speak. Um, and then commissioners, um, just a reminder that when we go to speak, we should open with, this is Commissioner Alicia Gargano um, or instead of this is Leishan Gargano, which I am particularly had trouble with last time. So <laughs> um, that'll help everybody identify us on the recording. All right. So our first uh, agenda item today is to approve the minutes from last time. Are there any corrections to the minutes before we have a motion? Or do we have a motion? Yeah, this is Sam Libby. Uh, I move that we approve the minutes from the April 15th meeting. Commissioner Sam Fitch. Do we have a second? Uh, Mark Bloomfield, I'll second. All right, um, I'm gonna do a quick roll call again. Uh, so, Mark Bloomfield. Aye. Sam Fitch. Aye. Leishan Gargano. Aye. Aye. Ann Goldfarb. Aye. Dan Hilton. Aye. Sam Libby. Aye. Melanie Neski. Aye. Okay, motion passes. All right, we have, i um, getting my agenda up in front of us today. Um, I'm sorry, I too many documents open here. We have um, five docket items today. Um, so we will be starting with docket SI-18-0003, City of Boulder. Alicia, Alicia oh, we have sorry. any staff updates? Sorry, this is Sam. Oh, Libby. sorry. Yeah, good point. Staff updates first. <laughs> Started up for nothing. Go ahead. That's okay. Maybe there aren't any. All right. If there are no staff updates, then we'll move to docket SI-18-0003, City of Boulder, Boulder Interceptor Sewer Relocation. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Sean Gambrell. I'm the planner on this docket. Um, as you mentioned, docket SI-18-0003, City of Boulder Interceptor Sewer Relocation. Um, let me share my screen here. Are you all seeing my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So um, this is an area and activities of state interest review for the relocation and replacement of the City of Boulder sewer interceptor line. The project includes replacing an existing 42 inch diameter concrete pipe with a 54 to 66 inch pipe to increase capacity and relocate the line to areas less susceptible to flood damage and erosion. Um, the pipe 
passes through a number of properties. I won't read all of these out to you, but you can read them here. Um, generally in the Valmont area of, um, of the county. Uh, passes through several different zones, primarily the agricultural zone, but you can see um, some other industrial and um, other residential zones as well. Um, and the applicant is Cole Sigmund from the city of Boulder. So just a vicinity map to show us where we're looking. Um, the interceptor replacement will start here near the corner of uh, Valmont Road and um, Butte Mill Road. Um, and will extend up through the Sawhill Ponds and Walden Ponds properties up to the Water Resource Recovery Facility um, up on North 75th Street. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. So just a quick overview of the, the um, interceptor. Um, the sewer in the area was installed in the 1960s, um, included um, 2.35 miles of 42 inch diameter pipe uh, made out of reinforced concrete. Um, during the 2013 floods, um, part of this pipe was exposed um, and had to be rehabilitated. Um, subsequently, in the 2015 um, flood events, um, another portion of sewer line was washed out. Um, so the city has an interest in relocating this line uh, further from Boulder Creek. Um, currently, the operational status is a wet weather peak flow of 33 million gallons per day. Um, and it's currently operating at 31.2 millions of gallon per day, so very close to capacity. Um, city master planning anticipates flow rates to grow to around 55 million gallons per day. And um, with this um, replacement, the capacity would increase to 87 million gallons per day um, and should adequately convey the, the sewage from um, city build out. Um, also, part of this proposal is to co-align a six inch pipe um, right in the same trench. Um, it won't be put into use immediately, but um, will be there um, for future use for renewable biogas that is produced um, at the water resource recovery facility. Um, again, they're just placing that in the trench while they've got the ground open. Um, that won't be put into use um, anytime in the in the particularly near future. Total length of improvement is about 2.4 linear miles of new interceptor. Um, so here's the existing uh, service area, the, the different um, pipes that run through the city. Um, and you can see the area circled here is um, basically the project area. There's kind of two different things that will be happening. Um, first, this section of the pipe will be abandoned in place and the new um, alignment will be put in if approved. Um, this section of pipe uh, that connects up with the Four Mile Creek or Four Mile Canyon Creek sewer um, will stay in service um, to convey the flows from this northern area of town um, and will be um, rehabilitated in place um, lined with you know slip lining or, or some other um, method that doesn't require um, excavation. And so just a little closer um, look this part will be retained, um, though this part will be abandoned in place here to the southwest. So here's a map showing the existing interceptor and the preferred route. Um, there were many alternatives that were analyzed. Um, this is the preferred route showed in orange here. Um, the purple is the existing interceptor. And again, this red hash here just kind of shows uh, the delineation between the area that will be uh, maintained for the four mile sewer and the area that will be abandoned in place. Um, you can see we start down here by Belmont and Butte Mill and end here right in the southwest corner of the uh, water resource recovery facility. Um, as I said, the applicants um, considered a number of routes. Um, these are the different segments they um, put together in various different configurations and um, analyzed what the best route may be um, for this new uh, pipe. And here's just a kind of a look at their scoring methodology. Um, don't need to go into detail on this, um, but you can see a pretty robust alternatives analysis um, and they did settle with this alignment number 25. Um, this was not the highest scoring, though um, pretty close to the to the top score. Um, and the reason some of these higher scoring alignments were um, were not chosen uh, was because of difficulty um, obtaining permanent property rights um, for the land where this pipe would go, you know, for maintenance and um, and other operational purposes. 
So just to get into our um, typical suite of maps here a little bit, just to, to talk about the environment of this, um, you can see in uh, this dark line here is the new proposed alignment. Um, you can see the area, of course, has um, many, many natural resources, um, including critical wildlife habitats, a lot of riparian area, um, a lot of wetland, um, and you know several other resource designations um, that need to be considered as we go through the criteria analysis. In terms of floodplain, um, no surprise, uh, pretty much uh, the entire western end of the alignment is within the floodplain, um, and some of the uh, sorry, the eastern end um, and sorry, some of the western end as well. Um, the existing interceptor actually mostly lies within the floodway, so um, this would be an improvement um, to, the, to the alignment in terms of floodplain. Um, also, there's some Prevels habitat in the area. Just wanted to uh, point that out. And um, in terms of geological hazards, um, you can see this runs through some areas of moderate hazard. Lots of public lands along the route, um, including, um, you know, some uh, county open space. I'm sorry, um, city open space over on the west side. Um, this is the Sawhill Ponds um, um, area, and then we have the Walden Ponds area as well. Um, you know, both very, both of these in particular, very important recreational public lands. So we referred out to the usual agencies and just a highlight of some of the responses we received. Um, our engineering review team noted uh, there would be numerous permits required uh, for work in the road um, and work um, elsewhere through, throughout the project uh, alignment. Um, they'll need a transportation management plan and staging plan. They'd also like um, interim progress plans and as built um, and a pre-construction meeting ahead of time um, to discuss traffic management, hours of work, et cetera. Um, numerous additions are needed to the construction plans um, versus what we're provided for permitting, um, which is expected. Um, and uh, just made a specific note that bike and pedestrian traffic at the South Boulder Creek Bridge um, needs to be maintained uh, throughout construction. Uh, Parks and Open Space, who are the owners of the Walden Ponds um, area, they noted um, numerous permits and clearances required uh, for work in their area, um, as well as the easements through their property. Um, they had numerous concerns related to um, disturbance of habitat and disturbance to recreational activities and amenities. Um, they also wanted uh, pre-construction surveys for critical species. Um, they recommended a number of conditions of approval to mitigate impacts to wildlife habitat and recreational facilities. Um, and in particular, um, there were pretty significant concerns about the um, separation embankment uh, flood control structure that is in between Bass and Cottonwood Ponds. Um, that is up near the Water Resource Recovery Facility. Um, it was put in after the 2013 floods. Um, and so they want to make sure there's no elevation change in that area that would create obstructions or otherwise um, uh, compromise the, the functioning of that structure. Our natural resources planner um, noted many concerns with the project, um, crossing areas with numerous comprehensive plan designations, important habitat and recreational uh, resources. Um, specifically, he requested additional surveys for species of concern prior to construction. Um, floodplain group uh, mentioned uh, a floodplain permit would be required uh, for all activities in the floodplain. Uh, most of this alignment does occur within the floodplain, um, so that will be required. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service noted a Section 404 permit is required from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Boulder Rural Fire um, requested that uh, road closures be minimized and um, disruptions to hydrant in the area also be minimized. Excel noted that they have um, nearby facilities, um, both gas and electrical, um, and that any activities within the rights of way will require approval. Um, in terms of adjacent property owners, we actually only heard from one adjacent property owner. Um, they cited concerns um, with the pipe's impact to groundwater flows and availability, um, noting, you know, kind of a, a lack of uh, water capacity in some of the wells and wells being very shallow um, in the vicinity and concerns that this, this pipe would basically become an underground dam to uh, aquifer flows. So um, something to note. And then several agencies um, offered um, no response or, or indicated no co uh, conflict. 
So in terms of the um, review criteria, there's quite a number as we go through the um, the 1041 review. Um, I've pared this down just to the most relevant ones. Um, there's still quite a few, so um, bear with me with these. Um, so the first um, group we'll look at is um, in Section 8511B. Um, criteria one, the applicant has obtained or will obtain all property rights, permits, and approvals necessary for the proposal. Um, and we'll put that in as a record, uh, condition of approval for, um, for, the, for this project. Um, criteria two, the applicant has the necessary expertise and financial cap uh, capability to develop and operate the proposal. Um, they state that this project has been anticipated since 2016 um, and has been worked into system budgets and no increase in fees are anticipated as a result of this. Um, they also have hired the expertise um, of a consultant, Burns and McDonnell, um, as well as using their own internal expertise. Um, so, you know, staff finds there's no concerns with financial capability or expertise. Uh, criteria five, uh, this is when we get into specific um, impacts. Um, so air quality is a, um, an impact that we reviewed the project against. Um, no long-term impacts to air quality are anticipated from this. There will be localized impacts um, like dust and exhaust, et cetera, from construction. Um, all of that will be handled through um, permitting through CDHPE. Um, and we do recommend uh, a um, dust mitigation plan as a condition of approval for the project. Um, visual quality is another area where we reviewed for um, for impacts. Um, so the new pipe will be located underground and significant in visual impacts uh, will be temporary. Um, there will be some minor impacts from manholes, uh, markers, um, things like maintenance, uh, travel ways, um, things like that. Um, but we think those will all be fairly minor in scope. Um, much of the alignment runs through previously disturbed and developed areas, uh, particularly at the western side of the alignment, um, runs through things like, um, you know, gravel pits and um, kind of industrial sites. Um, so really no concerns there. Um, Sawhill and Walden Ponds, of course, are the areas where we're most concerned about visual impacts. Um, those natural areas are actually man-made, you know, previously were, were gravel mines. Um, so those are expected to recover from the disturbance. Um, no major topographic changes are um, anticipated. So um, we think any um, long-term visual impacts in, through those areas will be, will be minor. Um, and across the alignment, ground cover and vegetation um, will be impacted, of course. Um, so we're going to recommend revegetation and we control plan um, and a specification that all trees that are removed are replaced with native species. In terms of surface water quality, um, that's another impact we look at. Um, here is the different uh, criteria that we're supposed to review. I'll give you just a second to look over those. So um, we did note that there would be some uh, localized impacts um, related to clearing and grading of pond banks, trench to watering, um, backfilling the trench. Um, could include things like sedimentation, turbidity, um, decreased dissolved oxygen. Um, we think all of those will be uh, essentially temporary and localized. Um, additionally, sedimentation and turbidity could occur um, from stormwater runoff from construction. So um, what we're um, anticipating is, you know, stormwater quality permit will be required for this work. Um, and uh, we would ask that a stormwater quality plan um, be developed that address these impacts. Groundwater quality sorry, groundwater quality is the next uh, area that we review. Um, the applicant has stated um, they anticipate no impacts to well functioning capacity or water quality. Um, and the natural resources planner and uh, one adjacent property owner have, however, um, raised concerns with the pipe obstructing groundwater flows. Um, so that may be something to discuss. Wetlands and riparian areas are another area we consider impacts um, again, most of the construction will be occurring in upland areas. There will be approximately six acres of wetland impacts and about 770 linear feet of stream and ditch impacts, um, things like crossings um, that will be impacted. All those impacts will be temporary and um, related to construction. Um, no long-term impacts to the structure and function of wetlands or their filtering capacity extents, et cetera, are anticipated. 
Um, and again, um, we would ask the stormwater quality plan be developed to address those impacts, um, which will be included in the stormwater quality permit. Terrestrial and aquatic animal life is another area we look at. Um, I'll give you just a moment to uh, read the different considerations here. Um, so the applicant did some um, wildlife surveys in 2017, 2019, um, and had some scheduled for 2020. Um, and they note that most of the impacts are in upland areas. Um, the potential upland impacts um, would be habitat loss, um, some you know wildlife mortality and displace, uh, displacement. Um, potential aquatic impacts would be related to sedimentation and spilled materials. Um, the impacts are expected to be minor, localized, and temporary. Um, there shouldn't be any long-term impacts to critical habitat or species composition um, throughout the project. Um, further, they're scheduling construction during the winter to reduce um, impacts to wildlife. Um, and just to um, reduce these impacts further, staff is recommending a condition of approval that staging and stockpiling locations be approved um, by the county prior to construction. Terrestrial and aquatic plant life is the next um, area that we review. Um, again, surveys were conducted in 2017 and scheduled for 2020. Um, there will be some local disturbance to vegetation. Um, potential aquatic vegetative impacts will be related to sedimentation and spilled materials. Um, no long-term impacts um, to the composition or functioning of vegetative communities is anticipated from this. Um, and as before, a revegetation plan and weed management plan um, that addresses these issues is recommended. Soils and geologic conditions. Um, the applicant has stated that the project won't significantly change topography, drainage patterns, or other characteristics um, of geology in the area. Um, if the topography near the Bass Pond Cottonwood Pond flood repair project will be changed, um, we recommend a condition of approval that the applicant provide topographic plans um, of those changes and comply with any mitigation measures that uh, parks and open space would require of them. Um, and as before, a stormwater quality permit, um, which will include a stormwater quality plan, will be required. Uh, criteria six, a proposal will not have a significant adverse effect on the quality or quantity of recreational opportunities and experience. Um, the recreational activities at Walden Ponds and Sawhill Ponds will both be impacted during construction. Um, those impacts will be temporary and will move as the construction of the pipe progresses um, and are scheduled to occur in winter when recreational use is reduced. Um, so it's the, the impacts won't be severe. It won't be that, you know, one whole area will be closed down. There will be other areas of both properties that can be used while construction is going on. Um, we would just ask that uh, the applicant um, clearly identify those areas that will be closed with signage. Um, and, you know, make sure that um, that that's very clear to users of the site who may be there at the same time as construction is occurring. Criteria eight, the proposal or its associated transmission system will not create blight or cause other nuisance factors. Um, there will be noise and odors from construction um, just necessarily. Um, that will all be um, regulated through the utility construction permit through the county. So. Criteria 13, um, for those applications which the director has required information on the environmental impacts and costs of alternatives, um, the proposal represents the least damaging alternative of reasonable cost. So they, the applicant um, did a detailed analysis of 29 unique routes. Um, the selected route is not the least impactful, but balances the environmental impacts um, with costs and impacts to things like traffic and emergency services. Um, staff would prefer an alignment utilizing the nearby um, RTD right of way. Um, ho however, the applicant um, has stated that RTD has been unwilling to grant permanent rights to this property, so um, it's really unfeasible for them to um, to be able to locate the pipe there. Um, the preferred alternative primarily traverses previously disrupted areas, um, and all impacts are expected to be minor, localized, and temporary. And then um, under Section 8511K, additional standards um, for development in flood hazard areas. Um, development shall preserve the integrity of the flood hazard area 
by not altering or impacting it in a way that is likely to pose significant threat to public health or safety or to property. Um, so the interceptor will be located entirely below grade, will not alter the floodplain in any significant way. Um, the alignment is located actually further from the floodway than the current alignment, which um, I think reduces risk both to the infrastructure as well as general flood risk. Um, and again, we would just recommend a condition of approval that it not impact the functioning of the bass, wood pond, or sorry, bass pond and cottonwood pond flood repair structure or alter the topography. Um, and if it does, that the applicant would uh, comply with any mitigation requests from the uh, Parks and Open Space staff. Um, and then a floodplain development is required because um, much of this development will be happening in the floodplain. So staff's recommendation um, based on the analysis summarized here and detailed in the staff report, um, we recommend that the Planning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners conditionally approve docket SI 18003, City of Boulder Interceptor Sewer Relocation subject to the conditions detailed in the staff report. Um, there are 54 of them. I do have them on subsequent slides if we um, want to discuss those, um, but I won't read through those individually. And that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. What questions, what questions do you have? Yeah, this is Sam Libby. I had a question on one of the conditions, uh, number 15, which relates to the work hours uh, on the site. So I just wanted to ask, <clears throat> those seem relatively short to me, um, knowing that the majority of the construction is not actually on traveled roadways, but is on private or non-traveled property. Just wondering if that's a standard set of hours or there's a way to extend that. Just knowing that a lot of the impacts you described are primarily during the construction period, is there anything you could do to shorten that would probably reduce that overall period? Yeah, so um, actually I've talked to the applicant a little bit about that. Um, it, exactly to your point that um, the, the longer the hours can be for construction, the shorter the overall duration of construction. Um, I did speak with our engineering staff. Um, this is primarily related to um, impacts to the transportation system, but they noted as well um, construction that's outside of the right of way um, will still likely have things like trucks entering and leaving, et cetera. So um, they were pretty firm in this um, in this uh, time period. Um, we could modify this condition to say something like um, you know no trucks or you know other transportation impacts would be outside of those hours, something like that. Is there any limitation on the days of the week in here? Um, they did not indicate that. So yeah, none, none are included at this point. Certainly happy to entertain. Well, then there's still, uh, this is Commissioner Alicia Gargano, and then there would still be room for the county engineer to approve alterations. Correct. So like, School is not if school is still remote when this starts. Just throwing that out, right? Like they could go till four. Or... Correct. Yeah. Th I mean, this this is um, you know unless explicitly approved by the county engineer. So there is that clause in there that allows that to be modified. Um, you know, a little more informally. Okay. Thank you. This is. Commissioner Hilton, um, could you speak a little bit more about the depths of the pipe? Um, so I, it sounds like the pipe will be at differing depths depending on the topology. Is it ever above ground or is there uh, is there a maximum depth that it will go? Um, the applicant can probably speak more accurately to that, um, but from the application materials, um, no section of the pipe is expected to be, you know, above grade or to um, raise the grade anywhere along the alignment. I think in general, they were um, in the vicinity of maybe six to seven feet below grade. But again, that does vary. Um, and I would ask that the applicant uh, speak to that. Thank you.
Uh, so my name is Cole Sigmund, um, the applicant. Sorry, and, Cole, uh, we'll, when we're done asking questions of staff, oh, uh, we'll- okay. Sorry, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Well, what other questions do we have for staff before we hear from the applicant? Um, Lee Shin, oh, this is Commissioner Melanie Nesky. Um, it looks like in the chat, the engineering staff said they're here to explain more about work hours. Do we have additional questions for engineering staff? Yeah, this is Sam Libby, Commissioner Libby. Um, I think just a comment to them to look at uh, potentially extending those in the future. I understand that you already were asked this by staff, so I'm not going to reiterate that, but um, it seems quite short in the interest of getting things done quickly. So in the future, it'd be look good to look at extending those if possible. Um, yeah, this is Jennifer Severson. Um, sorry, this is Jennifer Severson uh, with engineering review. Uh, we actually worded this condition specifically um, to allow um, that it could be uh, different work hours could be extended or the work hours could be extended by the county engineer um, if they requested it. So unless explicitly approved by the county engineer. Um, so we, we realized that uh, we may not be back in school, so there might not be school buses and traffic impacted from that uh, when this finally goes to construction. Um, also, uh, Sean's right. The The focus of this was really the transportation impact. So any area of work that is not going to impact the transportation system, like within open space, uh, if they don't have trucks coming in and out, then we're not so much concerned with that. This really is just the impacts to the transportation system. Thank you. questions for staff. Oops. All right, with that, I would like to invite the applicant to speak. Thank you. This is Cole Sigmund from the city of Boulder. I am uh, Taking over control and we'll share my screen now. Let's see. Can everyone see the presentation? No. There we go. All right, thank you. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So I'm I'm present and will be presenting. I want to also mention that uh, following the presentation, there'll be another chance for questions. Um, and I have um, our engineer, Brown, our, um, Burns and McDonald. They have uh, three folks on their team who are participating. And uh, also in attendance is the principal engineer for utilities at the city of Boulder, Douglas Sullivan. So uh, we should be prepared to answer um, a number of questions and uh, but hopefully the presentation will answer many of them. I wanted to start by saying that uh, I'm really impressed with the uh, with the staff report that Sean Gamble put together and uh, I, I thought it was a really high level, a high level of quality, and I, I was very impressed. So I just want to throw that out there. I know that he probably wasn't the only one who worked on that, and so just kudos to the team there at the county. So an overview of the presentation, I'll give uh, background on the project, um, and then um, focus on the project drivers uh, so that everybody can understand really why this is so important. I'd, I'd like to touch on a few uh, additional points on the alternatives analysis. Um, Sean did a good job of covering it already. And then I've got a few detailed uh, uh, slides on, the, on what have been considered critical project elements in the staff report. So 
So this project supports the City of Boulder's wastewater collection system. We own and maintain 368 miles of pipeline. Um, that's about 10,000 manholes. It conveys wastewater from homes and businesses to the water resource recovery facility located at 75th and J. And uh, that facility discharges clean water back into Boulder Creek. The master plan update in 2016 identified four of uh, what we call tier one or highest priority capital projects. The main interceptor realignment project is one. Uh, there are three others in various stages of planning and uh, design. Uh, one uh, going into construction is Goose Creek that will be constructed later this year. Baseline Foothills is slated for next year. And then the Arapaho uh, trunk line replacement is gonna be combined with the transportation project, uh, uh, you know, possibly even 10 years. Um, these target increased wet weather capacity. So the project drivers are capacity, uh, condition, and flood vulnerability. And I wanna to touch on each of these. The collection system as a whole uh, conveys water during dry weather flows sufficiently. Uh, there's sufficient capacity for dry weather flows. And it's only during wet weather flows that we really see big issues. Uh, the temperature plot that you're looking at on the right here is it displays the impacts, the projected impacts of a 25 year storm event. And that's our target level of service. Um, just like a green light, a red light, and yellow light in transportation, uh, the red uh, indicates areas where there are issues. Um, and so you can see that the interceptor uh, is shown here uh, all in red um, because it's too full at the 25 year flow. Now, just a point of clarification, this, uh, this system does not um, intentionally convey stormwater flows. So some systems are what, what are called combined uh, uh, systems. This is not combined, it's a sanitary sewer system, but uh, through uh, uh, what we call rainfall derived inflow and infiltration, rainfall events do seep into uh, our collection system and uh, there is uh, groundwater impact uh, into the collection system as well. And so it's those rain, rain events that really cause issues. What happens when uh, when the capacity is reached? Well, water goes to the path to the path of least resistance. Many times that's manholes. So these are some very visual examples of what manholes can look like. This is the storm, the, the flood of September 2013 in the area around the southern terminus of this project. Um, we don't have we won't show pictures of people's basements in the city of Boulder, but there were many, many basements that also uh, uh, experienced the same issue. I'll move on to conditions. So this, this pipe has been in service for 50 years. It's a concrete pipe, which was very common uh, in, in the 60s and, and on into the 80s. Um, concrete, reinforced concrete pipe has rebar in it. And that's what you see here in this photo. The, uh, the pipe is corroding from the in, inside out. And uh, what you can see is a rebar cage that's exposed. Um, in some places, the, the rebar cage that's exposed is actually the second layer of rebar. And so even if we weren't upsizing this infrastructure, we would need to replace it or dramatically rehabilitate this asset. It's at the end of its useful life. And um, for this reason, uh, the project is a very high priority for the city. Um, and for this reason, I'm especially thankful for everyone uh, for allowing this process to move forward, even in, um, in with these uh, remote requirements. The third, the third project driver is the risk of washout. And washout is a term that's used to describe when flood waters um, basically uh, uh, break a pipe or, or uh, dismember a pipe. Um, in these cases, luckily that didn't happen, but it came very close to happening. So on the left, this manhole was uh, washed over in the September 2013 flood. Um, it was subsequently reinforced. Um, the creek was diverted back to its banks, and uh, that pipe exists today as our existing 42-inch uh, interceptor. On the right, that was another rain event in May of 2015. Again, Boulder Creek left its banks and washed over um, and dangerously, dangerously close to an area of our existing interceptor. 
In this case, uh, um, it was over excavated, and on the right, you can see uh, where they are uh, reinforcing the um, the pipe with concrete. So the project that we end up with here uh, is our main intercept, interceptor realignment. The figure on the right shows a purple line and a gold line. Those are the same as in, in Sean's photos. The purple line is our existing interceptor, um, and the gold line is the, the new proposed alignment. Um, you can see that the purple line is very close to Boulder Creek uh, uh, and South Boulder Creek, basically all the way from uh, Butte Mill to the plant. This, it'll be, um, I won't read all these bullets, but yeah, each of these is about two and a half miles long. Um, this results in a, a total project cost of $48 million. Um, this is not the most uh, economically, uh, it's not, not the lowest cost option. And so just wanted to point out that our alternatives analysis was qualitative and costs were brought in uh, at a later date uh, once an alignment was chosen. Um, right now, the construction is slated from uh, 2022 to 2024. The original alternatives analysis included sort of four um, align, alternative alignments to the existing interceptor. So just to give a little bit of history, this uh, 1041 was submitted previously, but did not make it to the hearing previously. So this is the first time we've been in a planning commission hearing. Um, the, the northern alignment, as we call it, is this shows this blue line. And in general, this was a favorite alternative. Um, part of the reason why it was a favorite alternative is because it conveyed a four, the four mile trunk sewer that comes in from the north. Um, because there were some issues with that alignment, both with the creek crossing, with the uh, poor farm Fort Chambers property, which is approximately right here, uh, having significant cultural historical value, uh, in addition to ecological value, and a private property here, um, we were not able to uh, make that work. So what we propo proposed back then was uh, a hybrid, uh, which is this pink line, following uh, the RTD, and there's an orange line that shows an RTD alignment, and then moving north uh, through the CPW property and then through open space. We also contemplated a, a, an alignment in Valmont Road, um, which would be associated with a significantly uh, extended closure of Valmont Road, uh, which, uh, which was heavily weighted in our alternatives analysis. This next slide shows the four mile trunk sewer coming in from the north, um, which was not shown in that previous figure. There's also this lateral that comes in from an area east of Boulder Airport. So this uh, comprehensive alternatives analysis uh, looked at basically every, every possible um, scenario we could think of, uh, how to convey water uh, from, from Butte Mill Road and Belmont Road to the water resource recovery facility. You can see that a lift station is contemplated for conveying water from the four mile trunk sewer down to the, the main alignment, this lift station here. We also considered a pipe that may do the same thing. Um, the lift station has uh, a very high, uh, not only cost, but also risk um, and is an additional piece of infrastructure that uses energy, uh, requires maintenance. And uh, it, we have one lift station in our entire system. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's nice that we found an alternative to that. The alternative to that is this, um, what we call node R in this alternative analysis, but retaining uh, the existing alignment with rehabilitation and reinforcement uh, against floodwaters. And that'll convey this four mile trunk sewer flow, which is about 25% of the flow, uh, the total flow. So the proposed alternative is, sh is shown here. And uh, so just a, a more detailed look of these two options. I wanted to make a note about capacity. So in Sean's presentation, he mentioned the number 87 million gallons a day. Um, so our master plan design um, included 72.5 million gallons a day as the max uh, flow into, uh, max hourly flow into the water resource recovery facility. That includes about 25% or 25% of that comes from the north, um, from gun barrel to, to trunk sewers or, or interceptors that come in from north there. Um, and it also includes the four mile trunk sewer flow. So I just wanted to point that out because the design of this pipeline is conservative. It was designed for that 72.5 MGD. Uh, Sean also mentioned a figure 55.3 million gallons a day. 
And that's um, that's closer to to what the design you know will be. Um, but um, you know we've we've been having some internal discussions about that number being conservative as well. And uh, uh, we can get into that if in greater detail if you'd like later. So I'd like to get into these critical uh, project elements. There are three crossings I'd like to discuss. And then I'd like to discuss a little bit about what to expect with the interceptor uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and then uh, I want to talk for a minute about uh, the resources and how we this project would protect resources in these valuable areas. So the first crossing is this, uh, crossing is South Boulder Creek. The picture on the right shows Valmont. So if you were if you were headed from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen, you'd be headed into Boulder. Uh, you would have just passed Western Disposal on your left, and you'd be coming up to the intersection of 55th, where there's a post office on your right. Um, and and so um, north is this way. Um, so our our existing sewer is shown here in purple, uh, as it was in the previous figure. It's a 36 inch that goes under the creek. Uh, this needs to be upsized to a 42 inch, so this creek crossing is included. Um, likely it'll be an open cut. Uh, trenchless would be very difficult, if not impossible, in this area. Um, and it will require uh, close coordination with not only the county, but also uh, U.S. Ar Army Corps of Engineers, since this would be a uh, jurisdictional water. The next area I'd like to discuss would be crossing, and actually uh, it could be considered two or five crossings. Um, is the uh, is the uh, crossing of Valmont Road and 61st Street. So our, here's our existing sanitary sewer interceptor. On the right, there are two 36 inch uh, trunk lines that come in that join there and uh, and then uh, proceed north. Um, this, uh, by the way, is uh, just um, just east of where we just were. So um, right where that box is, where it says 60 uh, 36. Sanitary 36 inch sanitary sewer. That's the Western Disposal property. Um, you can see Butte Mill in the top right, and then the historic uh, town of Valmont in the top left there. Um, our, our new interceptor is proposed to, to grab these two trunk lines to cross Valmont. Um, we think as a draft concept, this, this could be possible as a trenchless crossing. And then the preliminary design shows the alignment proceeding along the north side of the right of way of, of Valmont. Um, jogging on um, 61st Street and then crossing 61st Street and proceeding along the south side of the RTD interceptor at the back end of the properties along Valmont Road. Um, a few uh, things to discuss here. Traffic coordination will be, you know, the most challenging in this project in this these locations. Um, one, one relevant point is that uh, there's a four lane and a four lane with a median most of the way. And then at this intersection, the four lane goes to two lane. And so we, we will have the benefit of working in a, a wide right of way and uh, a closure is not anticipated to be needed. And uh, the conditions of approval uh, ensure that that won't be a possibility. Um, we, we've heard a concern from neighbors in this area about the hydrology. We can get into that. We can uh, get into that discussion as needed. But again, just to restate, um, our, our hydrogeologists on this project do not uh, anticipate any impacts to groundwater in this area, uh, to the shallow wells that do exist in this, in this neighborhood here. Um, other uh, critical crossings are ditches. So the Jones Donnelly ditch crosses here. There's a lateral of the Jones Donnelly ditch that crosses in this area. We'll be crossing all three of those. Um, we'll maintain access to these driveways along here, and uh, we will maintain uh, the, the existing water table. The third critical crossing I wanted to discuss is the flood spillway. Um, so just to, uh, we've jumped to the end of the project here, um, north. Uh, east of where the, the red um, circle is designating the spillway is our water resource recovery facility. So those are two buildings that you can see as you walk on the Walden Ponds Trail. Um, the, the trail to the north wraps around the facility and there's a parking lot at uh, 75th and J. And then there's another access to this open space uh, on a road, a county um, a parking lot uh, to the south here. Um, through this area, now in Valmont, 
um, the the depth of the pipeline is 25 feet, and that's the maximum depth to the bottom of the pipe. Um, the the top of the pipe here is right at grade. And if you're, uh, I know there are some very savvy uh, board members. If you have looked at the preliminary design, it shows actually the pipe above grade in this in this area. Um, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the the biggest reason for that is that the lidar data that was used for this um, shows the condition of this, this area in its post-flood state. In other words, prior to the construction of the spillway. So we're committed to not having the pipe uh, uh, above the ground in this area, and that is a, a condition of approval. So just to orient you a little bit more, here is the existing 42-inch uh, sanitary sewer coming into the, the facility, and then the proposed 66-inch sanitary sewer coming from the south uh, over this spillway, and uh, you know you can see the spillway kind of looks like a sidewalk here. Uh, you know the critical aspect of this will be um, not only maintaining the existing grade so that um, you know we can maintain the existing uh, flood passing case capability of this structure, um, but to also maintain the hydraulic connection between ponds. Of uh, I spoke to uh, the um, the irrigation or the ditch specialist uh, at uh, Boulder County, and um, she is aware of a ditch through here that actually um, the con the um, conveyance is is blocked on the east side. So, you know, um, we'll be working closely with the county staff to make sure that um, this is re uh, reinstated and uh, that uh, there's another ditch crossing to the south. Um, so that's that's the the spillways. So moving to the existing uh, interceptor. In the excellent staff report, uh, one one issue that I wanted to just point out was that it, it stated that there won't be any surface impacts to slip lining. And I just wanted to show a couple pictures of slip lining to be clear about the excavation that we're talking about. And so on the, on the left, there's an HTPE line being installed. I think this is in Westminster. Um, this is being installed um, as sort of in a slip line fashion. And you can just sort of see the the size of that hole there. This will look a lot like if we line this uh, existing interceptor with an 18 inch HDPE line, which is one option. On the right, this is 36 inch, what we call GRP pipe. Um, a lot of people just call it Hoboss pipe by its brand name. And um, this is being inserted into a 42 inch pipe. And so that would be a lot, look a lot like what we have at our project. This is a project in Albuquerque and was shared with us by AUI constructors. Um, these are 20 foot sticks. Um, so this is a stick and the, the excavation houses this, this um, box and the, the uh, stick of pipe is placed into the box and then pushed into place and stabbed uh, into the, the next pipe over uh, by uh, some heavy equipment. And so in that way, you can replace or rehabilitate a very long section of pipe um, with just a small excavation. I'd like to address um, wetland and wildlife resources. This is a very rich area. Um, I would like to read through these. Um, we anticipate uh, 6.02 acres of uh, wetland impacts. This is critical wildlife area 25 in the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and high biodiversity area 27. Mm -hmm. um, the ladies tresses orchid uh, um, may exist in this area. Uh, so we'll be surveyed for that has not been found. Um, as Sean mentioned, Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat is in this area. There's a ripe heron habitat connector, um, Boulder Creek floodplain and associated uplands. Uh, there's bald eagle, uh, um, not on the project site or within uh, distance of the project site, but it is a uh, winter range for a bald eagle. Um, there, a bald eagle exists from view from the plant, but it's um, it's east of the plant. Mule deer uh, are also in here in the summer and winter. Um, this is a, a picture within the open space. So there are multiple ways that the project will address uh, these impacts and uh, uh, protect the critical wildlife habitat. One of them is that we're going to be required to construct in the winter. And so wintertime construction, um, mid-October to mid-March, mid um, is not going to be fun. But it's it, there are a few reasons that, that we're pushed into there. Uh, raptors, so there's an osprey nest in the, the CPW property. That's actually um, it's a state-owned property that the city of Boulder has management lease on. Um, 
and uh, their ditch crossings and um, um, in general, the wildlife is, is just less active in the winter. Uh, I want to also highlight uh, permitting coordination with federal agencies. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, refers us to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They administer the Endangered Species Act. So we'll be very, um, very careful and follow all the rules there. Um, we'll construct within marked easements. Um, we'll have a, a robust stormwater uh, protection plan. We'll follow recommendations from, from all uh, landowners, including uh, City of Boulder Open Space and uh, CPW and uh, Boulder County Open Space on reseeding and reclamation of disturbed areas. Um, noxious weed and aquatic nuisance species control measures, fencing and covering of open space areas to protect wildlife. And then um, there'll be an environmental resource specialist on site to survey for wildlife and monitor construction activities. Just two more slides here. Um, and I just wanted to uh, show and illustrate um, a couple projects where restoration has been successful. This is a Carter Lake pipeline project. Um, it's significant to show this picture now because this project was just completed earlier this spring and is delivering water uh, to uh, the city of Boulder 63rd Street Water Treatment Facility. Um, you can see the open cut construction on the left here. And about a year later on the right, um, the only evidence of that was these marker posts. This is a, a complicated, complex permitting uh, project that um, that you know illustrates the uh, the possibility of getting a huge a monumental uh, project through um, with some important um, um, planning. The other example is an example I have from Burn Burns McDonald from a water pipeline project in Gillette, Wyoming. Um, again, on the left, uh, open cut construction. And on the right, uh, approximately one year later, um, after revegetation and restoration. With that, as I said, I, I'm happy to answer questions. I also have some um, some staff that have other areas of expertise than my own. Um, just briefly, I'll show. This is the area of uh, this is a photo of uh, C the CPW property in an old gravel road where the project is proposed. Um, this photo shows the corner of the water resource recovery facility, Walden Ponds, Saw Hill Ponds, Valmont View. This is the Keter property. Um, and then uh, a photo of the facility where this water will end up. Thank you. What questions do we have? Yeah, this is Commissioner Libby. Uh, I had a question about the abandoned section between those two pieces. Uh, just a question of any concern, given given the quality of uh, the interior of that pipe that you showed, any risk of subsidence or collapse in that abandoned section? I wasn't clear what that was under or near, but you can speak more to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, let me get back up to a map where I can um, sort of show that. Um, and so the the Question, the area that Commissioner Libby is speaking of is between 61st Street here and, and Valmont Road and in the application that showed as abandoned in place. Um, that's our plan to abandon in place currently. Uh, we have sort of two options that we'll consider in final design for this pipeline. One of them is to uh, rehabilitate this downstream section to convey just the four mile trunk sewer flows. So that would be around an 18 inch pipe slip lined into the 42 inch pipe. We'd grout around that um, to provide some extra structural stability for that pipe. Um, and, and another option is to slip line it with a 36 inch pipe, much like the, sh the photo that I showed from, showed from Albuquerque. Now, if we slip line with 36 inch, that would give us the opportunity to have a junction structure in here to divert flow um, to this old interceptor um, so that we can maintain the uh, the new section of interceptor. That wouldn't work during wet flows. And we wanna be careful not to operate both at the same time during wet flows, which would over, overwhelm the plant for sure. Um, there's, some, there's some cost implications of this. There are some technical implications of this. We haven't made a decision yet. Uh, if we do um, end up um, going with an 18 inch here and couldn't possibly um, uh, reuse this section of pipe, 
then we would abandon and remove sections uh, that are adjacent to the creek as uh, conditioned in the uh, conditions of approval. Uh, we all we may also elect to rehabilitate this section. I'll mention that a, a significant uh, section from about, about here all the way to 61st Street is already rehabilitated. So it's already that new GRP pipe. And that was based on a breach that occurred in 2015 where the pipe was washed over and exposed um, close to 61st Street. So some of it's already done. Um, we may end up doing the rest of it. We may not. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. This is Commissioner Bloomfield. Um, when you say abandoned in place, is that, um, I mean, do you just, do you do anything to uh, like fill it in or anything like that? Or is it just literally you just maybe cap off the ends? Um, I think there is a condition of approval that addresses um, what we need to do in, in the vicinity of Boulder Creek, which is remove the pipe. But the sections that are deemed appropriate to abandon in place, uh, we would fill. Um, 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 the ends with, um, for example, uh, CLSM or, or concrete slurry. There's an example of that um, that's going to occur later this year on our Goose Creek interceptor project where we're abandoning our existing interceptor in place. And there's there's not much reason to, um, to um, remove that pipe. It's on our own land and um, it would just create more impact and more cost to, to remove it. Is there any the, I'll mention the manholes. The manholes are um, removed uh, at grade. The cones removed. The manholes are filled, and so there's no evidence of the abandoned pipe at, at grade. Is there any concern of collapse? You know, in 50 years or something. If there is, then it would be uh, reinforced or removed. I have a question. This is uh, Daniel Hilton. I have a question on the uh, biogas pipeline. Does that sit above uh, the wastewater pipeline? And uh, I assume that it would never be uh, exposed in any case above ground. Yeah, good question. Uh, so the biogas pipeline was included in the 1041 application. Um, I can draw your attention to Appendix B, the preliminary design. And at the very end of that drawing set, there's a detail that shows the biogas pipe. It's sort of more off to the side, but again, again with preliminary, preliminary design, we don't know exactly the best place for that pipe. Uh, what we don't want to do is put it right in the way of maintenance. Um, and so it would, it would be some distance um, to the side of the pipe, not directly on top, and certainly would not exist above grade. Thanks. This is Commissioner Neske. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the um, the hydrology near Valmont Road, the concerns from uh, from the public. And I know you said that there there is not anticipated to be any impacts. That's right. And so um, why don't I why don't I get started and then I can turn it over to our expert uh, Kate Hensky. Um, so that's a heads up for Kate. <laughs> um, so in this this area. Uh, is the historic town of, of Valmont. Um, in that area, they're served by wells, uh, and so many of those wells are shallow. Yeah, we're talking 10 foot, 10 foot wells. Uh, that, and um, while the city has infrastructure that runs through there, there are planning documents like the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and the uh, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan that, uh, that designate this area as Area 3, if you're familiar with that designation, um, we, you know, we can't offer services in, in this area. Um, and so the, their principal water source is, is these wells. And so they are concerned. So the, the pipe, you know, and generally, uh, generally it, it'll run under Boulder Creek and then along Valmont. Um, maybe I should flip down to something that's not an outdated photo <laughs> or a figure. Um, and um, with, with the pipe, the new pipe going in, down here, um, this is Valmont Butte. And so there's, you know, a big shelf associated with Valmont Butte. The pipe will be in the road sort of by this geologic shelf. And you might imagine that the, the water 
that fills the water table would be populated by South Boulder Creek and Boulder Creek, um, which, which converge at this point right here, south of Pit D, as it's called, and then continue. So the groundwater table in here um, is, is, um, won't be impacted by the pipe that's down in Valmont. Um, with, with that uh, very high level explanation, um, I'll turn it over to Kate Hensky. Are you there, Kate? Yes. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you. Um, I thought that Cole did a great job just explaining it. Um, I just wanted to make a point that I'm not an expert in, in groundwater, but I did speak with people within our firm who have a, a much better handle on this than I do. And the groundwater will still be able to flow. We'll have bedding around the pipe so that water can get through. Um, and it won't cause an issue to the existing wells, even though they are shallow. So the groundwater will still get through. And, and I might add to that, you know, a concern that was not expressed officially, but was expressed to us through other avenues from the ditch company um, and, and users of the, of the ditch water in this area uh, was that um, the, the pipeline would convey ditch water underground. And uh, there is an engineering uh, block uh, to that happening um, and it's called cutoff walls. And so cutoff walls are planned. Um, you know, you might imagine these being installed perpendicular to the pipe. So they allow water to flow past the pipe, but not, um, they, don't, they prevent this sort of new gravel uh, pipeline uh, as being a conveyance for groundwater that would deplete ditch resources and other groundwater, have other groundwater impacts. Thanks, Kate. This is Commissioner Goldfarb. I have a question about um, the bicycle and pedestrian traffic at the South Boulder Creek Bridge bikeway underpass. What, what will you be doing um, to that during construction to provide access? Um, so we haven't worked out, that's a good question. Thank you for that question. Um, we haven't worked out uh, exact transportation um, measures and tra transportation control, but we'll be working with Boulder County Transportation on that. Um, we, we frequently um, re redirect, temporarily redirect bicycle traffic as part of our transportation mitigation with large projects like these. And we would include those, um, those details in our, in our transportation permit. Um, so we are aware of the, the the need for bicycle traffic in that area, and we'll we'll provide uh, an alternate option when the uh, the existing one under the creek there is is not available um, to to make sure that bikers can safely cross. Um, I want to you know while you mentioned bicycles, there have been a number of questions in general on uh, other bicycle infrastructure. So there is a city of Boulder and county of Boulder County uh, mm -hmm. collaborative. Um, um, I want to say condition four covers the, the bicycle um, um, traffic diversion. I was going to add that there's a, a trail planned um, from that area, sort of the, this has been called the trail to nowhere, uh, right, right at that uh, South Boulder Creek um, crossing here. Uh, the trail ends. There's a continuation of that as planned 61st Street, and it's going to be along the RTD right of way. Um, they were able to obtain a, um, a temporary use a permit from RTD, and um, that was available to us too, the temporary use permit for a pipeline. But um, pipeline infrastructure, is, it's not something that we can uh, agree to have temporary access for. Um, there's also some talk about a uh, rail-to-trail project from this area uh, at 61st Street all the way to 75th Street. I wanted to point out that whatever we install in here, it will be compatible with um, with a future trail if um, the various transportation departments collaborate on such a project. Thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions? OK, 
Okay, um, with that, I'm going to give some instructions on how to do public comment. Sorry, there's background noise over here. Um, and then we will open for that. So um, any member of the public will have a chance to speak, even if you didn't sign up um, from the homepage beforehand. We are going to let anybody who signed up in advance speak first. Um, and then we can take anybody who signs up here in person. So if you join by computer, you can sign up by submitting your first name, last name, address, and the docket number in the chat box. Um, or if you're on your phone, you could unmute yourself with star six and just uh, state your name and desire to speak so that we can get you on the list. And then we'll go in the order that we receive those. Um, so when it's your turn to speak, you'll unmute yourself um, by either clicking the microphone button if you're on your computer or star six if you're on your phone. And um, staff will have a timing system set up and um, you'll get a warning when you have 30 seconds remaining. Um, please don't submit any comments or questions in the chat box. The chat box is really just for signing up. Um, it's not for any other purpose. Um, and um, just a reminder to direct all questions and comments to the board, not to anybody else um, on the call. As you know, when we're in person, you would face us and speak to us to do the same. My kid's having fun in the background. Um, and then um, I can direct any questions that arise during the hearing uh, appropriately. All right. So. Lishan, this is Richard Hackett, staff. Uh, I just wanted to let you know we're not, we don't have a 30 second warning for the end of the three minute comment period, but at the end of three minutes, there will be a uh, audible alarm that I'll use and it'll sound like this. Just want to make sure you can hear that okay. I can, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so with that, um, I am not seeing anybody signed up in advance. Is there anyone who would like to speak now on this docket? I don't see any in the chat or hear any. Okay, with that, I will close public comment on this docket um, and open for conversation among commissioners. Or if no, oh, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Willoughby. Um, just to, I guess, present my thoughts on that. So I would say, obviously, a very complicated presentation and, and plan here. Um, I think well presented and, and clearly look, looked at a lot of different alternatives. I think the scoring seems reasonable for that. Um, and I've thought about a lot of the different externalities here. So there's a lot of conditions there that um, I think protect the various values that, that we're looking for in the review and uh, I'm supportive of the application as it stands. This is Commissioner Ann Goldfarb. I would agree with Sam. I think that all these conditions and the ongoing um, oversight and, and process that will ha happen during this construction project between the city and the county, I think will, will serve to protect the county's interests here, and I feel comfortable with this proposal. Ms. Commissioner Bloomfield, I concur with all those remarks. This is Commissioner Nesky. I, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I really appreciate the, the weighted concern on the environmental impacts, the traffic impacts. Um, and I, I can imagine how many moving parts are in this project. So, um, you know, thank you for the thorough investigation in all of the different routes. And um, I, I think staff did a really good job in putting together all of the conditions that um, that address our concerns. Yeah. This is Commissioner Gargano. I definitely echo those sentiments. And um, you know, as any concern I had while I was reading through the packet, and then I'd go through and see the conditions and. Um, just how wonderfully they covered everything. So 
there are a lot of them, but I think that they are appropriate. Any other thoughts or motions? Uh, this is Commissioner Bluefield. I'm happy to make a motion. If we're ready. Uh, I move that the planning board recommend to the Board of County Commissioners conditional approval of docket uh, SI 18 0003 City of Boulder Interceptor sewer relocation subject to the four conditions as outlined in our packet. This is Commissioner Goldfarb. I'd second. Okay, with that, I'll take a quick roll call. Sam Pitt. I agree. Sam Libby. Aye. Melanie Nesky. Aye. Mark Bluefield. Aye. Dan Hilton. Aye. Ann Goldfarb. Aye. And then Leach and Gargano. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. With that, we will um, move to docket V-20-0002, Ryan Vacation. All right. Sounds like such a pleasant docket, the title. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioners. Rainy Ott with Community Planning and Permitting. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. 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 So I'm presenting docket V20002, the Ryan vacation at 1375 Eastview Drive. So we're located just outside of the city of Boulder, south of Arapahoe in the Crestmore subdivision. The applicant and owner is Daniel Ryan, zoned a state residential. A little bit of history, Crestmore subdivision plat was approved in 1955. And in 2019, just last year, uh, a new driveway and residence were approved for this lot by the Board of County Commissioners. The current request is to vacate a portion of the East U Drive platted right of way, increasing the lot size from 0.88 acres to approximately 0.92 acres. There is also an additional request, an exemption plat um, to replat the subdivision if the vacation is approved but that part of the request is not under the purview of the Planning Commission. Here's an aerial map of the subject property showing the Eastview Drive uh, on the right side. As you can see, it's not developed. And on the left here is the Crestmore Plat and the aerial on the right um, with the subject property outlined in blue and the area requested for vacation in red. On the left is a picture of looking west on Crestmore and then on the right is basically I just turned around and looked at the intersection of Crestmore and Eastview which come to a T. And then here on the left we are looking north on the Eastview right of way um, and then just approaching that slope looking down you can see the whole area of the platted cul-de-sac part of which is being requested for that vacation. And then looking back up towards that intersection of Crestmore and Eastview, and then um, just a closer look at the area of the vacation request. So this was referred out to the typical agencies and departments of note. The engineering development review team um, stated that pu the Public Works Department has no plans to develop the Eastview right of way and the request does not preclude any parcels from legal access. Um, therefore, the county engineer supports the vacation request as proposed. We sent notifications to 83 adjacent property owners and received no comments. For the vacation criteria of note, criterion B, unless otherwise noted, the portions of the road or alley vacated will be divided down the center. Since this um, portion of the vacation is noted on the site plan as just um, that 
area of the cul-de-sac, only that area will be vacated instead of dividing it down the middle. All the other vacation criteria were met for this docket. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend conditional approval for docket V20002, Ryan vacation, subject to the conditions outlined in the staff recommendation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Ryan, um, unfortunately could not be here today. He was in a bicycle accident and he is in the hospital. So if you have any questions, I will try to answer them as best I can. Thank you. Sorry to hear that. What questions do we have? You're not hearing any questions. I'll just open for discussion among. Oh, no, we have public comment first. So no presentation from the applicant. Um, I will quickly repeat um, public comment. So just a reminder, um, there's nobody signed up previously. If you'd like to sign up now to speak on this docket, please post your name and address in the chat. Um, or if you are on the phone, you can press star six and let us know your name and that you'd like to speak. We'll do the three minute timer with a buzzer at the end. And just a reminder um, not to ask questions in the chat box and to address the board members um, directly. So I'll wait a couple seconds to see if anybody wants to sign up. Right. Seeing none, I will close public comments um, and then open it back up for commissioner discussion. So, <clears throat> Commissioner Fitch, I would uh, move that the Planning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners conditionally approve docket V20002 Ryan vacation with the stated three conditions. Do we have any additional discussion or a second? Is Commissioner Bloomfield all second? Okay, I will take a roll call. Ann Goldfarb? Aye. Dan Hilton? Aye. Mark Bloomfield? Aye. Melanie Nesky? Aye. Sam Libby? Aye. Sam Fitch? Aye. Leeshan Gargano? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. All right, with that, I will open docket B 20 0003, the Walter vacation. Rainy Ott again. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm presenting the docket B20003, the Walter vacation at 350 Gold Run, 351 and 391 Grove Street, and then another parcel that's identified as Zero Hill, Hill Street. Um, so that we are located in the Gold Hill town site up in the mountains. The applicants and owners are Robert Walter and his sister Lynn Walter. The zoning is historic and just a little history. Gold Hill town site was platted in 1888. The request is to vacate uh, the Hill Street right of way east of lot five block nine and west of Grove Street in the Gold Hill town site. And for this one as well, there is an additional request for a subdivision exemption to merge lots one through four of block nine which is not under the purview of the Planning Commission. Here is an aerial map of the properties, just showing, showing the current conditions and um, you can see the Hill Street right of way going in between them. 
uh, public lands map, there is uh, some open space south of the subject properties. And then the plat is of Gold Hill is on the left, um, showing that block nine, lot five, um, and the, the Hill Street right of way going through there. Um, and then on the right is the aerial and what that looks like. Some site photos. Um, this photo is looking, standing on Grove Street, looking west towards the Hill Street right of way. Uh, you can see there's a pretty big hill. That fire hydrant is about in the middle of the right of way. And then this is looking back down that hill towards the fire hydrant again. And here we are looking north on the Hill Street right of way with that um, little barn over to the left and the residence to the right. And then looking west again as the right of way turns. So this was referred out to the typical agencies and departments as well. Um, of note, the Parks and Open Space Department initially could not support the request due to several concerns, mostly having to do with pedestrian access to the open space parcel to the south of the subject properties. Excel Energy also requested an easement. Um, they have some existing overhead lines within the right of way and they um, requested an easement for those. The County Engineering Development Review Team um, stated that Public Works has no plans to develop the Hill Street right of way and that the request doesn't preclude any, any parcels from having legal access. So the County Engineer supports the request as proposed. Um, and then we sent 112 uh, notifications to adjacent property owners and received two responses, one with no conflict and one in support. The vacation criteria, um, criterion B, again, as, unless otherwise noted, the portions of the road or alley will be divided down the center. Um, here, staff is um, recommending the establishment of a 10 foot wide utility and pedestrian easement along the former center, center line of the Hill Street right of way to address concerns from Excel and Parks and Open Space. All the other vacation criteria were met and therefore staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend conditional approval for docket V200003 Walter vacation subject to the conditions in the staff recommendation. Thank you. What questions do we have? I can ask a quick question. It looked like the home is in the easement. And so just thinking about that 10 foot right of way and what that looks like, I'm assuming it doesn't conflict with any of the, you know, existing Uh, the parcel boundaries and on the aerial are not exactly lined up. Um, the The house, I believe, is completely on um, these lots one through four of block nine. Okay. Thank you. This, this is Commissioner Libby. I had a question about the um, pedestrian access. So in the photo you provided, I think, looking west from Grove Street, looked as though the yeah exactly it's basically up up a hill that looks pretty steep to me and i'm not sure how pedestrians would access that property in that area is it accurate that the gold I think gold hill meadows property is actually just abutting the road here to the south because yes, i guess it, i'm questioning the need for that access um it looks like people walk to the south anyways to get there from this photo and mm -hmm. also it's accessible from the road entirely along its length Yes, so the open space is accessible from Grove Street directly. Um, the concern that Parks and Open Space had was actually access from the other side. So from Gold Run um, here, if you can see my cursor, I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, but they were more concerned about access from the middle of town without having to walk all the way around Grove Street 
Um, and so they wanted to maintain this access through here from the west side. I'm sorry, that wasn't clear to me. So the pedestrian and utility access is, a, is through the entire entirety of the requested vacation area. Yes, it, it basically is, but um, it would be through this corner mostly. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. I thought it was only the south part from the drawing. Thank you. And then the, is the fire hydrant outside of the vacation? You can kind of see it on the aerial right at the corner of the yellow right here, that little black dot. So it's on the very edge of the Hill Street right of way requested for vacation and Grove Street where they meet. What other questions do we have? Okay, with that, I would like to invite the applicant, Robert Walter, to speak. Thank you, Randy. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Um, like we've talked about on the phone, you know, I've agreed to, uh, to grant, uh, an easement to, uh, to Excel, although I think they already have one since the wires already there from the pole to my house. And, um, and, uh, as far as, uh, pedestrian, uh, access into the meadow, uh, I definitely will, um, uh, approve access that way. Uh, I want to um, make a note that uh, at the uh, east end of my property, I've uh, I've made a footpath uh, that it's a, it's a slight uphill grade that goes directly into the meadow, and that's how people access the meadow from my from my you know from Crow Street on the uh, east end. It would be uh, actually difficult uh, for anybody to to use that uh, from uh, the back of my house, um, but uh, I'll grant the easement anyway. There's another uh, another way into the meadow. Uh, it's from from Hill Street at the top of the meadow. There's a well-worn path up there that goes around the meadow and. It, and go into the meadow. It goes all the way around to the cemetery, um, and that's a very real popular uh, dog walking path or just a walking path. There's, you know, tens, of, you know, up to fifty people a day are using that. But um, yeah, I uh, any anything that they want, uh, I will do. I'm just trying to clean this all this property up before I uh, leave the world uh, and pass it on to my uh, descendants. Um, with that, uh, you know, I uh, invite any questions that uh, anybody may be concerned about. Thank you. What questions do we have? Um, hearing none, I will give the instructions for public comment again. Um, so just a reminder um, to, if you'd like to provide public comment, there's not currently anyone signed up um, previously from the homepage, but you can put your name and address in the, um, in the chat window. Um, or, you know, press star six to go off mute and let us know that you'd like to speak on this docket. Um, it'll, you'll have three minutes and there'll be a buzzer at the end or a, a charm, a nice charm at the end. And um, you'll need to direct all questions and comments to the board directly.
with that, I'll give you a second to sign up if you'd like to. Okay, seeing and hearing none, I will close public comment and open for discussion among commissioners. I'm happy to start. This is Commissioner Gargano, um, knowing that um, Mr. Walter is, is okay having the pedestrian path and in fact has um, you know, thought about it before and, and had it there. Um, that was the, you know, big sort of concern I had for him. Um, otherwise, I think it looks good. Yeah, this is Commissioner Neske. Um, I agree. It sounds like a good compromise to make sure you still have that utility access and pedestrian access if, if necessary, but um, no concerns. Glad to hear there's a good compromise. Any other comments or emotions? Yeah, this is Commissioner Libby. Um, one comment and then I'll make a motion. I think I'm fine with what's proposed. My, my preference would be to not have that easement personally, if, if at all possible, as it appears there's plenty of public access, but um, I'm happy to go with staff's recommendation on that. Um, it is a burden on the applicant as part of my reason for not wanting to proceed with that. But I'm going to move that we, um, the Planning Commission, recommend that the County Commissioner, the Board of County Commissioners, conditional approval of docket V 20 0003, the Walter vacation, with the three conditions in the staff report. Commissioner Fitch, I will second the motion. I will take a roll call. Sam Fitch. Yes. Sam Libby. Aye. Melanie Nesky. Aye. Mark Bloomfield. Aye. Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Aye. Dan Hilton. Aye. Ann Goldfarb. Aye. And this is Lucian Gargano. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. I will now open for docket BCCP-20-0001, geologic, geologic hazard mapping related amendments. All right. One moment here. Nope, that's not mine. <laughs> it looks like you have to share the whole desktop for it to show up in the recording. Okay, great. Did that do it? I'm gonna defer to staff. Chad, this is Rick Hackett staff. It did show up momentarily. Uh, now it's back. Uh, okay, you're, not, you're not in presentation mode yet. You're still in full um, PowerPoint mode. Excellent. That yep, should there, do it. There it goes. You're good. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Chad Endicott, staff planner with Community Planning and Permitting. And for the next item on the agenda, we have docket BCCP-20-0001 which entails geologic hazard mapping related amendments to the geology element of the comprehensive plan. And so the agenda for this docket includes simply this staff presentation, any questions for staff from commissioners, followed by public comment, and then again, planning commission discussion, followed lastly by planning commission decision. And for this presentation, I'll be going over the 
Boulder Comprehensive Plan Amendment process and status and where we're at uh, with this draft of the element. An overview of proposed changes, comments received from Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners, and then also revisions following the feedback re received by Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners. And finally, I'll provide staff's recommendation. All right. So as you can see here on this slide, there are several steps in the process of amending the comprehensive plan. The first step entails staff providing planning commission with a draft work plan and then planning commission will authorize staff to proceed. And then the next step entails planning commission to review the draft element or amendments in a public hearing. And then the Board of County Commissioner will review any revised draft or amendments following that hearing in a new public hearing. And then Planning Commission will review and adopt a final draft in a public hearing, which is what this presentation entails, providing the final draft to Planning Commission. And followed by that, if approval is received, Planning Commission will adopt the resolution and amend the comprehensive plan upon certification by the Board of County Commissioners. So I just kind of want to give that overview to let everyone know on the call where we're at with this. And to start us off, I will provide a brief overview of what the changes to the geology element include based on geologic hazard constraint mapping developed by County Contracted Consultants, Caesar Incorporated and Terra Cognito GIS Services Inc and Planning Commission feedback during the review of this mapping completed in 2018. Staff developed the proposed changes that you see listed here on the slide and the following. The changes include revisions to definitions, a new land use guidelines table and map, which will be used by county development review teams to determine what type of hazard study is needed if necessary based on geologic characteristics that are present. And then lastly, there are some policy changes that reflect the new geologic hazard mapping. And here is just another slide of the continuation of the policies that changed. And before diving into the actual changes, I wanted to provide an overview of the feedback received from previous Planning Commission meeting this last February and the BOCC hearing in March. In the staff packet, you will see the actual red line changes proposed along with the original text. And the upcoming, the upcoming slides include the recent edits that are a little easier to read. And at this time, I will go over the proposed changes quickly and just, just those that have been updated since the last two hearings and then answer questions and address these changes in more depth following the presentation. And I can also share my screen to go through the actual draft element changes if that's uh, makes it easier for folks as well. Hello, Chad. Yeah. My apologies. This is Anna Milner staff. Just wondering if perhaps you could move the minimize screen from teams over a bit so that that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, we just yeah. recording this on the video too. So we just wanted to be sure we could see your slide. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Cool. OK, so on February February 19th, staff presented the updated geology element to Planning Commission and the following recommendations were provided to staff for consideration. First, they wanted to see an expanded uh, definition to the undermined areas definition to include all types of mining, not just coal and undermined areas that are shown on the hazard mapping where that hazard, hazards have been um, the most prevalent. And also based on referral comments received from the Colorado Geological Survey Planning Commission wanted to see language throughout the updated sections to not limit geologic hazards and constraints to those um, just shown on the uh, hazards mapping and guidelines table. Because of course there could be additional hazards or constraints not always displayed on the landscape scale map that um, was completed. There was also a recommendation to clarify the studies within the guidelines and table uh, that I will go over here shortly, which were in fact recommendations and not requirements. And lastly, there was a suggestion for publishing individual map layers for public viewing since the composite map is, is complex and can be hard to determine sometimes what is going on with a particular property. 
And this is something the staff will continue to look into with the publishing of this element and accompanying mapping to avoid confusion and increase usability, usability by the public. And I know we've received public comment too about educating the public on uh, mapping efforts as well. And this is a part of the staff's role with this with the comprehensive plan. So following the planning commission meeting in February, staff made minor revisions to the draft geology element with feedback from the planning commission and the county's consultant and the Colorado Geological Survey. The revisions were presented to the Board of County Commissioners on March 31st and the feedback received from Board of County Commissioners for peace planning commission to consider include suggestion to update policy GE 101 um, really to make the language a little more restrictive to ensure development was not occurring uh, frequently in hazardous areas unless there's an extraordinary circumstance with adequate medication to ensure the, the safety of the public. There's also a comment to reconsider the inclusion of the fluvial hazards definition that was removed in the last round of edits and i'll go over that soon as well and the main concern here for both of these comments is for the safety in the public for safety of the public and the board of county commissioners didn't want to see further development in hazardous areas or including those that may inc include fluvial hazards and of course, not those that are included in the regulatory floodplain. A little bit of a delay here, one moment. There we go. In this next session, I will review the revisions to the geology element based on the feedback received from Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners. The revisions to the definitions, policies, and land use guidelines table are relatively minor and I've included all proposed changes to the geology element and have noted on each slide where the revision has occurred since the last two hearings. And for the purposes of this hearing, as I mentioned briefly, I will go through the proposed amendments quickly with a focus solely on the new revisions since there wasn't any requested changes. Again, the actual red line changes are included in the staff report and the slides are just here for reference. And so, okay, so first we have a few revisions to the definition section. The, this hasn't changed since Planning Commission saw this. However, fluvial hazards were brought up during the hearing with Board of County Commissioners, as I mentioned, and the floodplain, the floodplain management team within the county provided useful feedback during the referral phase and suggested removing the fluvial hazards definition from the comprehensive plan since fluvial hazards are not referenced in the geology element or in the geologic hazard and constraints maps. And additionally, this definition is not in the current geology element. And to address the OCC's comments to suggest leaving in this definition, in many cases, fluvial hazards are located outside of the regulatory floodplains and fluvial hazards are, of course, important and would ideally be mapped and an company policy will be written into the comprehensive plan eventually, in addition to the regulatory floodplain and associated regulations. Um, and this definition in the geologic element, the geology element, uh, could be misleading. And that's why it was originally proposed to be removed since it doesn't exist anywhere else within the geology element. However, the Board of County Commissioners comments do address the need for further analysis regarding uh, the fluvial hazards. So that was a long explanation. The other should go a little quicker. Uh, the geologic hazard definition was updated to based on planning commission feedback to expand geologic areas to include, but are not limited to those hazards shown on the geologic hazards and constraints map. And I think that is an important distinction to make and staff also updated the undermined area definition as recommended by planning commission to include any previous mining activity, not just coal mined areas. And the land use guidelines table for geologic hazards and constraints developed with CSER incorporated was also updated to include feedback from the Colorado Geological Survey. And the purpose of this table is again for those everyone on the call uh, is to provide guidance regarding the treatment 
of each type of geologic hazard or constraint for the purposes of reviewing and improving development on properties with such characteristics. And this is to be again provide guidelines for uh, development review staff to use in the assessment process for, for projects. And as you can see on this first slide, the description of this table has been updated to call out the fact that this table is really to be used as a starting point and additional hazards and constraints may be present during uh, a site specific study for a certain project that may be ne deemed necessary. And those changes are, are shown in red there. Okay. And so I just wanted to show briefly really minor changes to the land use guidelines table. I well staff included the expanded qualified professional to qualified professional geologist to be consistent with the Colorado professional geologist definition and just provide any uh, cl clarity here and that may have been missing previously. It's the following slide as well. So the proposed changes to policies since the last two hearings. So the following proposed changes account for language revisions to reflect county characteristics and the updated ma mapping and the revisions you see in blue reflect the feedback recently received from the Board of County Commissioners uh, again to ensure that the county is being uh, proactive about um, keeping the public safety in mind when um, looking to review new development in hazardous areas. So I'll read this because uh, it's it's newer and so the county may develop programs to mitigate existing development and will only allow development in geologic ha hazard and constraint areas when a project poses low risks, trails, etc., or it is an infrastructure project without viable alternative locations. And in any case, development in a hazard or constraint area will need adequate mitigation by county staff. And the revisions here really reflect the feedback received and also uh, discussions with county staff and how to best address the fact that there are a wide variety of projects that fall under uh, the, the category of development throughout the county, whether that's public or private. And so ensuring that staff takes a harder look at uh, potential hazards and constraints and may recommend uh, more site specific study when needed and definitely mitigation it, if building in a hazardous location. Um, and however, there are some projects that do pose low risk, such as trails and open space that may not uh, need as hard of a look. And then also in red at the bottom of this slide is feedback received from the reflects feedback from the Colorado Geological Survey, uh, basically again saying that additional hazard constraints may be identified through site specific study. And the next page is just a continuation of this policy since it is quite long especially with recent changes and just expanding this as well to include the types of studies that are required by a qualified professional and expanding that to include a professional geotechnical engineer uh, with that have geologic conditions as included in the bulleted hazards listed below. And this is more uh, relevant with industry standards. Let's see. OK, and then lastly, the last change is. A evaluation of geologic hazards constraints in unincorporated areas, and this again is really just to continually assess geologic char characteristics after natural hazards. Since, as we all know, there is and what initiated the original mapping efforts for hazard constraints was following the 2013 rain and flood event, which changed a lot of geologic characteristics in, in the county. So it, it was important to uh, include this policy and we added the staff added in red here at the end for um, feedback to have any additional evaluations reviewed by Colorado Geological Survey or an independent qualified professional geologist and or an independent qualified geotechnical engineer just giving the extra level of analysis and review to ensure we're covering everything that's needed. And so lastly, staff 
request that Planning Commission approve the proposed amendments to the geology element of the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and docket BCCP-20-001. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, hearing none, we will go to public comment. So can I get a reminder about how that works? Um, if I'm not seeing anybody signed up in advance uh, for comment on this topic, but if you would like to sign up now, you can put your name and address in the chat. Um, or if you're on the phone, you can do star six and just go off mute and let us know that you'd like to sign up. You'll get three minutes and there'll be a nice little chime at the end of the three minutes to let you know your time is up. Reminder to direct all of your questions and comments directly to the board. Um, and then if we, you know, have if there's follow up on those questions, I can direct them as needed. I'll give you a couple seconds to sign up. Okay, seeing and hearing none, I will close public comment and open back up for commissioners to discuss. This is Commissioner Libby. Um, Overall, yep, super happy with the changes. Everything we kind of talked about last time in terms of quality is, is the same. So I uh, appreciate that. I think I made the comment last time about the mapping and availability of these layers, which I appreciate you guys are looking into mm -hmm. uh, and the feedback from the staff report. I think sp specifically for this element, there are so many things that are specific to a property um, and how it's impacted that I just want to reiterate that that's really important for the public to have access to that information, yeah. um, to know how to apply any of this to their own planning and uh, brainstorming process, they really have to see what's, what, what, what impacts them. And I think last time you guys presented, you, you showed us some very detailed maps that were that went into the calculation of the changes uh, to the amount of, pro of area covered by this. And um, you know, whatever we can do to get those out there to the counties and the residents would be great. Otherwise, I'm very supportive of the changes. Thank you for your time. Other comments or a motion? This is Commissioner Hilton. Um, I think this looks pretty well refined at this point, so um, I'm willing to offer a motion if there are no other comments. Uh, so I move that Planning Commission approve the proposed amendments to the Boulder County Comprehensive plan and adopt docket BCCP-20-0001. Commissioner Bloomfield, I'll second. Okay, I'll take a quick roll call. Ann Goldfarb? Aye. Dan Hilton? Aye. Mark Bloomfield? Aye. Melanie Nesky? Aye. Sam Libby? Aye. Sam Fitch? Aye. And Leisha Gargano, aye. Thank you. All right, on to the final docket of the day, docket BCCP-20-0002, document template conversion related. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. And can you see my screen? And uh, we can see this. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, um, good afternoon. This is Molly Marcaselli with Community Planning and Permitting. 
Um, I'm going to be presenting docket BCCP-20-002, Conversion and Redesign of the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and Related Content Amendments. So um, just a quick overview of the agenda I'm going to present, and then um, commissioners can ask me any questions, and then public comment, opportunity for uh, me to respond, and then discussion among planning commission, and then a decision. And just a quick overview of this presentation. Um, I'm just going to go over a quick slide. Chad actually already did a great job doing this, um, of just the comp plan amendment process and status, just to see where we are. Um, then a, an overview of the overall proposed changes we've made to the comp plan, and then um, look into the comments and suggestions that we received from Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners, and then uh, look at a summary of uh, staff's proposed solutions to those comments and suggestions, and then we'll end with a recommendation. So I won't really get into this. Chad did a great job kind of discussing where we are in the process. Um, we took this to planning commission for comment back in February and then brought the revised draft to Board of County Commissioners in March. And now we are bringing it in front of planning commission um, as a final draft for adoption. And so this slide I put in here just to um, kind of refresh what the major amendments to the comprehensive plan were. Um, the rest of this presentation is really going to focus on the comments we received and staff's uh, solutions to those comments. So um, we did a big kind of redesign of the comp comprehensive plan in its entirety that included the, the layout and the graphics. We added a planning history timeline. We um, added an open space acquisition chart, which um, we showed both of those at uh, the previous meetings. And we've also updated the regional context map, which is found in the introduction. We replaced some of the images and maps with higher resolution versions. We made revisions to the executive summary to better frame the document. Uh, we reorganized and refined the countywide goals and the element goals. And we also revised the amendment process and history um, section as well as the um, information sources page. So um, these were the main comments that we received from Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners. Um, I'm going to get into these in a little um, a little more in the in the following slides, but um, the main comments were recommending that we uh, rename the subheadings in the countywide goals section, uh, rethinking the pagination of the document. Um, they also wanted to wanted staff to incorporate uh, municipal open space into the open space graphic that we had in the open space element. And we also received a comment to think about maybe removing some of the photos in the document, um, which we will get into. So the first comment, uh, renaming the subheadings in the countywide goals section, just as a quick ref refresher, um, in the countywide goals section, there's a subsection called standalone goals, and those goals are really supposed to be more high-level goals that don't um, correspond to any specific element in the comprehensive plan. And then there's another section called goals compiled from countywide elements, and that's really just a summary of all of the goals found in each individual element. Um, and so when we were thinking about renaming those, we came up with two options. And so the first option would be to uh, change the title of standalone goals to countywide goals, and then change goals compiled from countywide elements to element specific goals. And then, so this section has endnotes too, and they basically just explain what the standalone goals are and what the goals compiled from the countywide elements are. And so we're also proposing to just take out the endnotes and move the language um, to the beginning of each subsection as sort of a mini intro to provide clarification. And then option two, uh, similar to option one, change the name standalone goals to countywide goals, and then actually completely remove uh, the goals compiled from the countywide elements section, and then move the language in the endnotes that pertains to the standalone goals to the beginning of that subsection, and then remove everything else in the endnotes. Um, and so we kind of felt like we could remove the goals compiled from the countywide elements section because we didn't really feel that it served a very significant purpose to the overall document. Um, and it would actually end up kind of being a little more work for staff when we do update elements. We'll have to also update this section, um, which isn't a, a big deal, but 
again, we just didn't really feel like this um, this section really served a lot of value for the for the document. And so those are the two options we're proposing. Um, another note, I'm not sure if anyone's really had time to kind of look at the actual goals themselves, um, especially in the standalone goals section, but staff does feel that um, another update that wasn't really within the scope of this update will be needed in the future um, to really just kind of reassess the goals in that section and ensure that they accurately reflect um, the goals and visions of Boulder County. So I just wanted to, to note that. And then so the second recommendation that we heard from Planning Commission and BOCC um, so was pagination. So currently we have it um, divided into each section. Each section kind of has its own numbering <coughs> um, format. And it was recommended that maybe we explore just doing a more consistent numeric kind of one through 100 um, type system. And after a lot of discussion, staff has decided to actually keep the numbering format as is uh, for the following reasons. So most navigation is going to be done online, and so we don't really think um, page numbering is going to affect ease of navigation. Um, also, when individual elements are updated, it will prevent staff from having to renumber and reprint the entire document. Um, this way, we can just update the table of contents and print out that specific element and replace it. Um, also, when referencing the document with the public, we typically include direct links to either the page or the section. Um, so I don't think in any case the members of the public are really going to be scanning the document, having trouble trying to find a specific page number or section. Um, staff can also change how page numbers are displayed in PDF in PDF form. So um, if we wanted to reference a specific number, um, we could reference it as page 50 rather than like AG5. Um, this is also the format that the comprehensive plan has currently, as well as the land use code. So it would be um, consistent with a relevant document. Um, this is a very simple fix too. So if we do find that this numbering system creates issues, we can easily change that. And lastly, uh, the printed versions will have tabs to make navigation easier when you're actually using the, um, the hard copy. And so those are the reasons we've decided to keep uh, the numbering format as is. And then, so we did receive a couple suggestions to incorporate uh, municipal open space into our open space graphic. So um, again, just as a, a quick refresher, at the last meeting we had presented um, a graphic we worked with open parks and open space to make, um, and it reflected uh, open space acquisition in Boulder County by decade, um, but it didn't include municipal open space. And so we worked with open space again um, to actually just create a, a separate graphic. And we really just wanted this graphic to be really simple, just kind of at a glance, what is the breakdown of protected lands in Boulder County? And we were able to break it down into five categories. We have county, municipal, state, federal, and other public lands. And so this right here is not the final form. Um, we will still have to put it in the document and it will be uh, more consistent with the the color scheme and the, the overall theme of the comprehensive plan. Um, but this is definitely the, the idea that we had and we'll most likely probably add percentages in there as well. And then um, we wanted to add a little blurb that says approximately 68% of Boulder County is protected as open space. And then the notes section that'll um, accompany the, the graphic as well. So when we were working with open space, we quickly learned that trying to make a very simple, simplified graphic with really complicated data is not easy. Um, and there's kind of a lot of nuances. And so we want it to be as transparent as possible with, with all of the data. Um, so we don't have to go into the detail of those notes. We can um, go back to it if you want, but um, that's just what we're gonna include with the graphic. And then um, one of the Board of County Commissioners did recommend um, maybe thinking about removing some of the photos in the comprehensive plan. Um, they felt that the document was just a little photo heavy. And so we had some discussions about that and we have decided to just keep the, num the current number of photos throughout the plan as is um, for the following reasons. So we did work with InReach, which was the graphic design firm. Um, we've worked with them already to remove several photos to try and balance the ratio of, of photos to text already. And so the plan in its current form already reflects those efforts. Um, and we felt that removing more photos would 
uh, create some issues with overall formatting of the document as well. And so those are why we're going to um, we're not going to remove any more photos from the document. And that leads us to our recommendation. So staff requests that the Planning Commission provide direction to staff for improving the countywide goal section and approve the proposed amendments to the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and adopt docket BCCP-20-0002. Thanks. Okay, with that, I will um, give the quick rundown of how to participate if you're from the public and want to um, speak. So just a reminder that um, I don't see anybody that signed up ahead of time, but if you'd like to sign up now, you can um, enter your name and address in the chat, or you can, uh, if you're on the phone, go off mute with a star six and do it uh, verbally. And we will get you three minutes on the clock, and there'll be a nice little charm at the end of that three minutes um, when you're done. Um, just a reminder not to submit any comments or questions into the chat and to make sure you direct all questions and comments to the board. I'll wait a couple seconds and let you all sign up if you want. Hearing none, I'm going to close public comments and open it up for commissioner discussion. Commissioner Bloomfield, uh, I'll say that it um, seems like you know, the direction that staff moved in uh, is a good one. Uh, they, it seems like they uh, held their ground on some things with some good reasoning. And I uh, definitely think that the update overall is welcome um, and will make the, make the comp plan much more accessible. So, uh, I'm in favor of it. Uh, this is Commissioner Fitch. Uh, I agree with Mark that the overall direction is quite good. I don't have any quarrel with any of the particular changes in this last round. I, I did have time to go back and scan through most of the uh, draft document, and I think it's a real improvement over what we've had in the past. There's more integration among the elements. Uh, my one complaint, but I wouldn't want to put it in this round of revision. Uh, it's way too long. <laughs> it's 159 pages to describe the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan. Uh, and I know as an academic, writing shorter is, writing, is harder than writing longer. Uh, but I do think that's a sort of longer term goal that staff ought to look at is how, how we can, how we take the elements that we have and condense them uh, to be more succinct so that somebody who really did want to sit down and read the whole thing uh, could do so without taking a day or two of their time. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Gargano, I think that ties into um, the other Sam's comment, you know, just that long term goal of accessibility, right? People being able to see how it applies to them and what that means to them in a in a quick way, which I know is very difficult. Um, but always a good thing to do, right? This is Commissioner Libby. Um, I think in the interest of the first question being asked here around the direction on those two options, which I think mm -hmm. is on uh, page three of the staff report, 
Uh, I think my preference is, is option one, which I think is simpler um, <clears throat> and clarifies the naming. Uh, it's somewhat hard for me to tell the difference between both of them in a lot of detail um, and that we haven't seen how it would look to have option two implemented, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to go forward with option one as a recommendation uh, as it's shorter and more straightforward, knowing that they're going to also revisit those in the future planning uh, effort. Thank you. This Commissioner Libby again, I'm happy to make a motion. Um, if nobody else has any comments on these options or on anything else. Okay, I move that the Planning Commission approve the proposed amendments to the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan and adopt docket number BCCP-20-0002. Do we have to provide, um, should we provide information in the motion about option one versus option two? That's a good question, is it just that we should suggest it or that it should be part of the motion? I feel like as we provide a direction on that, which is what was requested. If nobody has any of their comments, sir. Yeah. I'll second the motion. Next. Hi. Hi. Mark Murphy. Aye. Aye. Uh, I think you said me. I, I lost my sheet, so I'm going by memory and I'm <laughs> oh. sorry. Uh, my audio is a little sketchy. I think you muted yourself again. Yeah. Really Hi. Did I get, sorry, did I get everyone? Or did I do Ann Goldberg? Hi. And then they should Lishan, this is Richard Hackett staff. Can you just, uh, just to make it clear, because he did cut out, can you just clarify what the result of the roll call vote was? Oh, it was a unanimous yes. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we can conclude this meeting of the uh, any question. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.